And we are back with the third segment of the GSMC Basketball Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Sports Network. I apologize for that longer than normal break, but how did you like that new ad? So, regardless, um, let's go ahead and go into the third segment. I have another game going on in the background, like, uh, so I'll see exactly what game this is because I'm using a streaming service right now provided to me by Quinnipiac University. Shout out to them. And I'm just going to see exactly what game this is, and I'll just give quick updates on what I think and, like, what's happening. So, but let's just go ahead and give a quick recap of NBA basketball from last night and some of the important games that went down and some big stories that happened. So the first big story that I think I should talk about is Kevin Durant going up against the the Phoenix Suns going up against the 76ers. Kevin Durant, he um, ended the game with, oh, okay, so it looks like this game is Auburn going up. Not No, wait, no, not Auburn, Akron, pardon me. So regardless, the Phoenix Suns, they're, they won 115 to 102. Kevin Durant in this game just passed Shaquille O'Neal in the scoring category. So now Kevin Durant is ranked eighth all time in scoring just passing Shaq, obviously. Shaq gave him his flowers. And one thing that I do remember, Paul Pierce, he said this about KD. He said if Kevin Durant did not get injured for, and like did not play for, if he played all the games without getting injured the way he got injured, he would already have 40,000 points. And I don't really want to touch on this this much because he's only saying that because LeBron James, his literal father, is the one who holds the 40 points record and obviously he's going to do everything in his power to talk down on LeBron. That is just who Paul Pierce is because he is bitter, he is sad, he is very very annoyed that LeBron just seems to ruin everything in his career. And that's just the way it is. That's why I said that LeBron is his father. He's not really his father, but you guys get the idea. And Obviously, like, I mean, if you have that one guy that's just, like, constantly being talked about and just diminishes everything that you do, you're going to feel some type of way. So it, it makes sense. He's just he's just triggered. He's mad, and he's doing whatever he can because now he's not playing in the league, and LeBron is still playing in the league, and it really looks like LeBron is still the best player in the league. So, But I digress. So I always got to make it about LeBron. I'm sure that's what all of you guys are saying. Oh, he always has to make it about LeBron. Well, guess what? Huff. So Kevin Durant ended the game with 22 points. Um, let's see his shooting. 10 of 18 from the field. Grayson Allen ended the game with 32 points. 9 of 15 from 3. 10 of 17 from the field. One of the craziest stats that I saw was that in this season alone, he's had nine games where he's hit five plus three-pointers or more. If I remember correctly, I believe that was the stat. And... Regardless, like, I mean, Grayson Allen has been phenomenal this season. And he's really shown that he can be a very important asset to the team and going into the playoffs. Because, like, that's sort of the things that, like, Phoenix, like, well, they don't have the defense, they have the scoring. And I guess, you know, you can fall, you can have scoring, but it's like you should have defense to fall back on. On Golden State, when Kevin Durant was on that ridiculous super team when he was playing with the Avengers. Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, Draymond Green, Sean Livingston, Andre Iguodala, all of those guys. You guys know exactly what I'm talking about. When he played on that team, the Golden State Warriors, they might have been the greatest offensive team ever assembled, but they also had great defenders. Like, Clay Thompson was an elite defender. Draymond Green was an elite defender. Kevin Durant, while he was mainly a scorer, his length made it a lot more difficult for a lot of small forwards to get clean looks at the basket. Let's see. JaVale McGee, he was a great defender. Andre Godala coming off the bench, since he didn't have to really score the ball that much, he could focus on the defensive side of the ball, which he did phenomenally well. And, again, it's always like you have something to fall back on. Because if one of your players doesn't play well, like, for example, Bradley Beal going, up, going one for six in this game with three points, you have something to fall back on, and you have something that's reliable and efficient to fall back on. But that's just my take on it. And Devin Booker ended the game 7 of 15, 18 points. Not really much that needs to be said about this game because, you know, Philly has been playing absolutely terrible without Embiid this year. They are really bad. I'm going to do, like, some math real quick. Let me see. So they were 
they're 28, they're 26 and 8 when they had Joel Embiid. And they're 12 and 23 without him. So obviously, like, I was wrong in thinking that this team would be able to answer back to a lot of these teams and win a couple of key games. I was completely wrong. But not much that needs to be really be talked about for that game. Another game that went down was OKC going up against the Jazz. Again, not really excuse me, not really much that needs to be said about this game because like Shai Gilgis, like he obviously ended the game with 31 points. Every single time I look at that box score, he has 31 points and I just don't understand how he does it. He is he is one of the greatest. Like he is one of the best guards that the league has seen right now and it's really really impressive what he's doing for the Oklahoma City Thunder and like what he's doing for basketball as a whole and it's like people really forget to talk like they say he's the MVP but at the same time they say Chet is the rookie of the year how does that work like I don't understand how that works whatsoever I mean how are they gonna argue I mean I think the, I think now like the Chet rookie of the year debate is just completely over i don't think there's anyone that can say anything about uh that debate whatsoever because victor Wembanyama is clear-cut rookie of the year arguably defensive player of the year and since we are talking about victor there was an interesting stat that i looked at with 13 games left victor has more blocks and steals than the last nine players in their defensive player of the year winning seasons Maybe he's the defensive player of the year. Who knows? I think, and another interesting stat, the last 15 games that Victor Wembanyama played, when he's on the court, the Spurs are ranked number one defensively. When he's off the court, they're ranked 25th. So obviously, he brings a lot of value to the team on the defensive side of the ball. But Rudy Gobert, he still has that argument. And we'll see exactly like which team ends up uh well which player ends up winning it i say i can't believe i said team but it's really ironic because while it's an individual award it's really determined by team success sometimes and i don't understand like where that's coming from now in this modern and in this modern era where it's like wins sort of have to determine like i get that i get wins determining value i totally understand that but for other awards like defensive player of the year It's just looking at a player and it's defense. Like, the defense, yes, it could bring value, but it doesn't bring as much value as offense because the goal of winning the game is to put the ball in the hoop more times than the other team can put the ball in the hoop. And that's what the game, especially in this offensive heavy era, that's where the game boils down to. But I digress. Not really much that needs to be said about this game. There's no really out, outlying scores. Well, excuse me. Colin Sexton, he ended the game with 25 points on the Utah Jazz. I mean, Chet Holmgren ended the game with 25 points, 14 rebounds. Also had a poster on, but I mean, he's seven foot two. You'd ex- you really expect him to get a poster, right? And let's see. Jalen Williams ended the game with 18 points, four assists. And, again, like, you know, really consistent game coming in from Shai Gilgis Alexander. 31 points. Again, like, it's like he just gets all the points. He just gets 30. He gets to get 31 every single night. Next game on this list is the Clippers going up against the Trailblazers. Now, the Clippers ended up winning 116 to 103. Very dominant win coming in from the Clippers. It was so dominant that James Harden decided to play defense on his own team. There was, If you guys paid attention to Instagram, there was literally a clip of James Harden. He passed it to Kawhi in the corner, and then he ran out to Kawhi to close out as he shot the three. Like, if you guys remember, like, I know you guys are not going to like me about this, but when LeBron did it first, when Rajon Rondo faked the lob and LeBron James faked the swat, that, that, that was sort of the same vibes. The difference is that Kawhi Leonard didn't end up making that shot. Didn't. But still, very dominant win coming in from the rest of this Clippers squad. Paul George ended the game with 27 points. Uh, James Harden ended the game with 19 points and 14 assists. Kawhi Leonard ended the game with 24 points in an and one. That was a very good, that was a very good clip that I saw of him getting that basket. Now, the Trailblazers, again, without Dame and without really any future there's not much that was really that could be 
picked out of this game. I mean, Scoot had a pretty good game, 18 points, 6 of 15 from the field. But it's like, it's, these are the trailblazers. They're bottom feeders. There's not really much that needs to really be talked about with this game. So let's just move on. Now, the Pacers, they went up against the Detroit Pistons. Obviously, they ended up winning because it's the Pistons. And the Pacers, they... Uh, Tyrese Halliburton, he finally had a 20-point game after f- what it feels like three weeks. Good Lord. And shot 9 of 13 from the field. Now, like, of course... When I talk about him, now he's deciding to, like, oh, let me just remember to play basketball. Like, come on now. And he ended the game with nine assists. Pascal Siakam ended the game 25 points, eight rebounds. So very good game coming in from him. Now, Aaron Naismith, 14 points. And again, with the Pistons, there, haven't, there hasn't really been – there's not anyone on the team that's good enough to lead them. Cade Cunningham, you know, he's, he's inefficient – but he does get a lot of points. In this game, however, he only ended with 23 points. Ended the game with 10 assists, and but he shot 22 shots. So very inefficient. But, again, especially after this Sir Thompson uh, blood clot, they're really not going anywhere. I'm sorry. This team has really no hopes and dreams anymore. And there's not really much that needs to be said because, like, the Pacers, they just did what the Pacers do best. They play offense, and they do it very well. Now... Next game on this list is the Miami Heat going up against the Cavaliers. Jimmy Butler ended the game with 30 points. I mean, yay. Like, sure, he's playoff Jimmy is back. Sure. Like, that's that's what everyone's, that's what everyone's probably going to say just looking at Jimmy once he goes into the playoffs. And it's like, whatever. I'm sorry. I'm not a big fan of playoff Jimmy Butler. I think he's a myth. He's only good in the first round, and that's really it. Like, is that really playoff material, just being good in one round? No, you got to be good. Every single time the light shines brighter, you have to be better, especially as the star player on your team. Now, and with the reputation that he has. Like, if he didn't have that reputation, I would not be this harsh on him and his playoff, his playoff prowess. But that's just me. And Terry Dozier, 24 points. He's been very, very good for this Miami Heat team. And Nikola Jovic, Nikola Jovic, not Jokic, ended the game with 14 points, 5 of 12 from the field. There was no, there was no Bam at a bio. But no Bam, no problem, going up against the Cavs. Now, the Cavs, they still, don't, they still don't have Donovan Mitchell. They still only have Darius Garland, 20 points. He played 41 minutes. Jarrett Allen ended the game with 25 points and 20 rebounds. Good Lord. And Karis LeVert ended the game with 16 points and 12 assists. Again, these are ridiculous stats that are coming in from the Cavs. And let's see. George's Niang ended the game 18 points. And while it was a very close game, the Heat ended up going out on top. The biggest difference being the Heat's defense, and I think is their defense. Like, and Jimmy Butler. The fact that Jimmy Butler was in this game. I don't. I know I said that playoff Jimmy is a myth, but I'm not saying that he's not good in the clutch. Because he is. But only in, like, really the first rounds most of the time. In other rounds, he's sort of... He's a bit meh. I'm sorry to say. It's just like, meh, It's whatever. But, like... But I digress. Now, the biggest game on this list was Milwaukee going up against the Celtics. Now, the Celtics ended the game one, winning 122-119. to 119. The Bucks, I really don't think they're going to do much. They can't beat the Celtics, and I understand the Celtics played at home. They, didn't, they also didn't have Giannis, and it's very, very odd. For some reason, Damian Lillard plays a lot better without Giannis. I don't know why. I don't know what it is, but he plays so much better. With with Giannis, he's averaging 23.9 points, 4 rebounds, 7 assists, 42% from the field, 35% from 3, and 92% from the free throw line. Without him, he's averaging 31 points, 8 assists, less rebounds, only but like 4 rebounds, that's just about it. 49% from the field, 45% from 3, and 95% from the free throw line. I don't know how he puts up more points and shoots much more efficiently without Giannis Antetokounmpo. The whole reason why they brought why he got paired with Giannis was so that way he doesn't have to do much or like he can still like do a lot on the offense 
while still have a, a buddy on the team to also do a lot on the offense. That was sort of the reason why they paired them up together because they were going to be like the next, the next one-two punch, the next Kobe and Shaq. And I know those are like ridiculous like aspirations, but these are the talks. And I think it's absolutely absurd because it's like, why? Like, how is he playing so bad when he has Giannis, someone who can facilitate and make better lo- and give players a lot better looks because he draws so much attention? It doesn't make any sense to me. I just don't get it. But I digress. So going into the Celtics game, Jason Tatum, he ended the game with 31 points. Derek White ended the game with 23 points. And Jalen Brown ended the game with 21 points. Chris Stapps ended the game with 17 points. Again, this team is just ridiculously stacked in all positions. When they all play well, it's very, very, very difficult to beat them. I think the only team that really has the best chance of beating them is the Denver Nuggets. But that's just my personal opinion. Now, let's see. Going into let's go right ahead. Going into Golden State, going up against. Um, the Memphis Grizzlies, they won 137 to 116. And let's just go ahead and take a look at the box scores of this game. Now, Kaminga, 26 points. Andrew Wiggins, 22 points, 10 rebounds. Steph Curry, only 14 points. They None of the starters played more than 30 minutes, which really goes to show like how, how they really took this game. One of the biggest, and the biggest story wasn't even really like the game itself. It was more so, believe it or not, Draymond Green getting into another fight. Like, I don't understand how he gets into these fights all the time. Maybe he does have a legitimate problem. I'm starting to think that he does have a legitimate fighting problem because there's no way that he just constantly gets in these fights despite constantly getting warned, don't get into fights. I just don't understand what his logic is. I don't understand why he keeps doing this and keeps putting his season and his career in jeopardy. Now, G.G. Uh, Jackson ended the game with 35 points. Santi Aldama ended the game with 27 points. Again, these are a lot of like a lot of players that like you don't really hear. Like when you think of Grizzlies, you think ooh, Ja Morant. But since he is out for the rest of the season, not really much for the Grizzlies to do. Not really much. Not really much for the Grizzlies to compete with. Jaron Jackson Jr. ended the game with 28 points, and even with all of this great performance from these players, they still got blown out by 20 plus. And ooh, the Spartans and the Bulldogs are back to starting. That's fantastic. So now, um, they're the start of the second half, 31 to 24. So let me know in the comments. Would you guys like that to be my fourth segment? One of these days, just like watching and calling the game live you guys let me know in the comments what you think tough shot by michigan state great way to open up the quarter good job now let's see okay with that we that was basically all of the games that happened last night and we are out of oh wait a minute i missed one sacramento kings excuse me the kings they played the toronto raptors and the Kings ended the game 123-89. to They ended up winning. The Sabonis ended with another triple-double, 13 points, 17 rebounds, and 10 assists. These stats are absolutely ridiculous from Sabonis. So far, the trade between the Pacers and the Kings from like Sabonis with Halliburton, it's looking like a win-win trade. And the Raptors, obviously, they're incredibly short-handed with um, not having... Uh, not having Scotty Barnes in the lineup. So what I thought was going to be a playing team or ten ended up not being a playing team. Scotty Barnes, he definitely he definitely served me well for um for fantasy basketball. He was a great pickup. He got all the stats that I would need him to get. De'Aaron Fox ended the game with twenty points, eight of fifteen from the field. Malik Monk ended the game six of twelve from the field, seventeen points, one of seven from the field. From three, excuse me. Harrison Barnes, six of nine from the field, 16 points. And again, really dominant win coming in from the Kings. And it's a much expected dominant win coming in from the Kings. Uh, let's just go ahead and look at this game. Okay, so Spartans are hitting some free throws. Score is 35 to 27 right now. And this Mississippi ends up having the ball. So this will be the end of the third segment. So join me for the fourth segment where I go ahead and talk a little bit more 
about Kevin Durant passing, um, well, making it to the top eight in scoring. Because I touched on it a little bit, but I didn't really talk about it as much as I wanted to. But let me know in the comments if you guys would rather listen to what's going on in this game right now, listen to what's going on in future games, or if I just give if I just continue doing the fourth segment the way I've been doing these fourth segments. So I will be right back after this short break. <laughs> 